I probably should have stretched before we start. Show everybody your pits, it's fine. I can you see them? No, we're covered. We're covered. We're all good. <laughs> we're all good. Um, Our, people aren't gonna pay for it if, if they're not, you know, just naked pits out, you know? Dun ooh, ooh. Pits straight up pits on main. Pits on main on the Dungeon Bros channel here for the Duels and Manadorks podcast, episode seventy-eight of the Duels and Manadorks podcast, where we put our pits on main. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to Duels of Mana Dorks, a D&D and Magic the Gathering podcast. I am Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And I think that is a much better intro than what I did for our last episode of Bonus Action, which I don't know what that was just wild. I was so... Three times you messed it up. I know. I was just... I was so fucking exhausted. I had... I had friends, a friend's wedding recently. Uh, this last weekend, as of recording, my stepsister also got married. So, like, two weddings very close together, swim meets, like, the whole... It's been a whole fucking ordeal in this household. So much shit going on. Unnecessary amount of shit going on. Uh, and somehow, I've, I've still managed to do effectively nothing. Oh, the cat's being adorable. That's that's wonderful. The that's cat wonderful. Is making her appearances. She's been... She has been particularly snuggly recently because of the massive temperature drop that we've had. And it's very clear that she's, she's a, she's a chilly little girl. Like she never, she never like curls up in the bed ever. (laughs) So yeah, you know, you know, nice little, nice little background thing. If you don't want to look at our ugly mugs, which is fair. And for those audio only listeners come to the, come to the YouTube channel. You can see a cat. Yes. YouTube.com slash the Dungeon Bros, where you can get this uh, every week, every other week, sorry, every other week, free, open, free feeds, uh, Mondays, every other Monday. You can get it a, a week early, ad free, on Patreon.com slash Dungeon Bros. Join at the $5 tier, early ad free access to all the podcasts. There's other tiers. You can get your name right at the end of the show. It's a whole thing. But of course, you can get, like, we have, Patreon has, like, the RSS feed. So you don't actually have to listen on Patreon because Patreon app kind of sucks. I don't know if you're aware of this, Sam. Patreon app's garbage. I, like it wasn't. No, I always it, go to the website for the like two patrons I'm on. Yeah, the website's fine. The website's fine. The app, on the other hand, absolute garbage. So like, you can take the RSS feed from a Patreon podcast and you can put it like just put it into whatever podcast service you like. Like I've done it with Apple Podcasts. So like, you can literally just copy the RSS mm-hmm. feed and you can shove it into Apple Podcasts app, and then it just gives you that as a separate feed. So it's a whole convenience thing. It's wonderful. Um, recently, we had a bonus action with our good friend Wyatt, the typical Gemini. We we finally got around to doing a set review of Duskmorn House of Horrors and. I gotta say, you know, Bustin makes him feel good, and so does Duskmorn. <laughs> it was so much, so much Ghostbusters memorabilia, dude. He he puts my Lord of the Rings fandom to shame by like a lot, and it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what I'm to say. Let that one hang in the air for a minute. Just, just let it. Just let it dangle there. That'll be fun. Um, but yeah, you can check that out. It's uh, free for everyone. Uh, we do some of the bonus actions. We do a little early release on Patreon, uh, but they all end up eventually coming out on free feeds for everyone. Um, we probably should have a, a bonus action with someone about the fucking bracket system for Magic the Gathering, because there's been like a whole yeah wave of people talking about like what cards they want in what bracket and there was like a, a reddit survey and it was a whole ordeal so we we talked about it last episode it was I, you know it's i don't know if it's making things easier like it's supposed to be i don't know if it's making things more fair like it's supposed to be i don't know if it's going to be used ever let's be honest oh yeah i, I mean, don't know i don't know what what uh what convention you know Oh, oh, my deck's a my deck's a tier two. It's fine. It's like, but you you got a mana vault in there. What do you mean it's tier two? He's like, oh, it's just the one. It's fine. And then it turns out there's like six tier three cards or some shit in there, and it's all everyone's gonna I, lie. I was talking to our friend Lincoln, uh, and I was talking to our friend Lincoln, and he was saying he's like, you know what I'm going to do? And he said, I, you know what I'm, a lot of people are going to do is they're going to go and they're going to build the most powerful tier X deck. 
Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter that it's tier one. It doesn't matter that it's tier four. It's going. You know, there's going to be a way. There's going to be a will. There's going to be a way that this thing can combo off on turn whatever. Oh, you know? absolutely. I mean, even like that's already kind of happening. If you look at like competitive popper commander. Those decks, like, mm-hmm. the, the best decks in that format are combo decks, and they're only using commons and a single uncommon commander. So, like, yeah, the, pow- the power is all across, all across the spectrum. Even, even tier one cards are going to have a place where they're just completely busted and cracked open. Um, a lot of, uh, some of those weird random cards that are going to be busted with very particular cards come in the Marvel Secret Lair Super Drop that we got. The leaks were real. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a little while, but let's get on to uh let's get on to the upcoming releases as we do every single week for D&D and Magic the Gathering. D&D is uh well, it's kind of been the same for a while. We're waiting for the core three books, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so of course the player's handbook is out. It has been out, and it will continue to be out. However, it'd be weird if it wasn't out anymore. Away, <laughs> right? They just retract it. They just took it back. They're like, ah, we we made a mistake. Never mind. Uh, um, but now, less than a month away, we have the Dungeon Master's Guide that'll be coming out November twelfth. We got a little bit of um, we got a little bit of a talking point on that a little later in the episode. Mm-hmm. And then finally, for Dungeons and Dragons, we have the Monster Manuel that'll be coming out on February eighteenth of next year. Yeah, and a lot of creators have been getting their preview copies for the Dungeon Master's Guide as well, and started to give their reviews and their thoughts. Um, one of one of my one of the newer D and D YouTubers, Pointy Hat. He's one of like those faceless YouTubers. He's got like his little pointy hat, like little caricature. He actually like just sits down as a person in front of a microphone and just talks about his review copy of the DMG for like 45 minutes. Very good. Very good watch. Highly recommend. There's a lot of, a lot of useful information and from what it seems. People are really liking it a lot more compared to the 2014 DMG. So that's another like big win for us. Let's go. Let's go team. Uh, all right, moving on to magic, the gathering, uh, like we mentioned, we did a whole set review on Dustmorn House of Horrors, which is out now. Uh, great set. A lot of cool stuff in there. Go check it out. Mm-hmm. Next up we have, with Mystery Boosters 2, we'll be coming at uh, Magicon Vegas. Uh, if you're watching when this... Uh, if you're watching on the paid Patreon, that'll be sure. this coming weekend. If you're watching on free feeds, it's coming this past weekend. Yeah, uh, you've already missed it, uh, you fools. Be, uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> absolute buffoons. Uh, that was October 25th through the 27th at MagicCon Vegas. Uh, next actual release will be Foundations, the five years sta- uh, the minimum five-year standard set. Uh, that will be releasing on November 15th. So we'll talk a little bit about that in the up- upcoming episode, this episode. Uh, looking a little more into the future, we have next year's remastered set coming out on in January will be Innistrad Remastered. That's going to have some cool stuff. Oh, Innistrad, the Innistrad sets in general have fantastic card designs, and people really, really love Innistrad almost as much as they would love Ravnica, I think, personally. Uh, I, so, yeah. And w- with the with the breadth of quality of cards across so many Innistrad sets, and they're going to be bringing it all back, you're going to get a ton of value. I'm almost sure of that. So, very excited for Innistrad. Yeah. Uh, And then we do have a look at the upcoming uh, uh, tease sets so far. Just to quickly run them down. In Q1, we'll have a Racing World set. Uh, In Q2, we'll have a Return to Tarkir. Q3, we'll have a Space Opera set. Q4 will be Lorwyn. Uh, We also have Universes Beyond Marvel and Final Fantasy next year. Within 2026, we'll be returning to Archivios, or Strixhaven, as well as we'll have the conclusion of the Omen Path arc. Yeah, yeah. The Universes Beyond Marvel is actually a full set, much like uh, the Lord of the Rings set that we got, which is different than the Secret Lair Super Drop that we are going to be getting here in in the coming month. Uh, So those are two separate things. Um, But... Let's jump. Let's jump down. We're gonna we're gonna talk about this commander and getting into the news, of course. 
getting into the news. We got to talk about the commander advisory panel. So the the magic, as we talked in the last episode, uh, the control of the commander format for Magic: The Gathering has gone back in house with Wizards of the Coast, and they're talking about creating an advisory panel to kind of be the rules committee for the commander format going forward. Uh, there has already been some consternation amongst people that are in the know about the commander advisory group uh specifically gavin dugan this article is from ntginsider.com they have a lot of very good stuff over there uh gavin dugan who is a former member of the commander rules committee and is going to be a part of the new commander rules committee advisory group is apparently would be legally prohibited from criticizing magic the gathering For his entire lifetime, he said on X, formerly Twitter, we should just call it Twitter, X is a dumb name, quote, the vendor contract for the commander panel includes a surviving non-disparagement clause, which means it limits what I can say about them forever, even if the contract ends. I don't mind the non-disparagement clause, but I'm uncomfortable with it in perpetuity. And then he asked for his audience's thoughts. He later uh, later that day went on to say, since, quote, I think WotC is doing a bad job of managing commander, end quote, could reasonably be considered disparaging the company. This seems kind of important. And they've said that all members of the new, quote, RC panel will receive the same contract, no exceptions. And then he went on to say, for the sake of clarity, I'm optimistic they will do a good job of it, but I want to preserve the right to the pub- to be public with that opinion if it goes wrong. Um, so, of course, all of this happened after the recent bannings, uh, the, the Commander Rules Committee going in-house. Um, it's interesting... <laughs> like, we've... we've <laughs> We've seen them try to do these, like, control the narrative kind of plays with magic with D&D in recent years. And every single time it comes out early before it's implemented. And every single time the community is like, it's a little fucked up. You shouldn't do that. And they're like, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. We won't do that. We won't do that. And a... We were we were talking before the episode, and you mentioned you brought up non disclosure agreements and how those are no longer legal in a lot of in a lot of uh, instances unless you're like a high ranking executive of a company. And this just kind of feels like a workaround for that. What do you what do you get of of from the vibe? What vibe do you get from a non disparagement clause in perpetuity? Even if they leave the panel, they are no longer able to. Yeah, I mean. To look at it from a a company perspective, which we try to do our best to look at it from both sides, uh, we un- it's understandable what Watsi is thinking here because the the community does have a lot to say, and uh, the people on let's say the inside, in this case the people on the panel, uh, you know, have some sort of perceived authority. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily the perceived authority of actually making the bans, which they do have the authority on, but how the community should react. And I think that Watsi and Hasbro over the past several years has proven themselves pretty skittish of what the community is capable of doing and has had to go back on their words so many times, uh, and often because of insider leaks or whatnot. Um, however, that being said, these are, you know, we're... We're still people who play the game. We're still members of the community. It feels very limiting and, you know, would be one that I, if I was offered that, I'd be very hesitant to not to accept that contract, not just turn it down and walk away. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like there's going to be people that would want to be a part of this this committee, this panel that will otherwise choose to not simply because of a principled standpoint of not wanting to have to censor themselves in a way. And I feel like those are exactly the people that you would want on this panel in the first place. It just kind of seems like there's a chilling effect that they're trying to put down on, on negative talk about the company, which I think is, Obviously, any business is going to want that, 
but it's it's not great when it's when it's being foisted upon your group of people that is in charge of the most popular format of the game. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to keep them very honest. I think behind closed doors, it's not going to affect their conversations at all. It's just not going to, it's not going to give them the ability to bring the public into that conversation because they're not going to be aware of, of anyone's actual thoughts really. And they're just going to have to figure it out on their own. Um, which as we've seen from the public community for Magic the Gathering can, lead to some really dumb takes and, and really abusive behavior. So I don't know. I think, I, th and not I only think that, yeah, not only that, and, and kind of what Gavin was saying in his first one, um, or in his, 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 I think commander is doing bad, uh, or sorry, I think Watsi is doing a bad job of managing commander could be considered reasonably considered disparaging comment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that sort of thing, yeah, how how much is Watsi going to consider disparaging? You know, where are they going to draw that line um, could very much be almost a uh, another um, Pinkerton situation, if you will. Like, what are, you know, that was definitely an overreaction. Where are we going to, are we going to see another overreaction from things like this? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the... <laughs> I still I still can't get over the fact that they that the Pinkertons was sent for the aftermath set of all things. Like they really thought that was going to be the shit and I mean this is all this is already a company that's massively influential and powerful and has boatloads of cash to do whatever the fuck they want basically. So um that remains to be seen. The more important part of all of this is going to be what who's actually on the panel and and what they end up wanting to actually do. I think this is just an interesting little, little footnote along the way that, uh, needs, that needs to be talking about. Uh, another thing that we need to talk about is Gizmodo, sadly, unfortunately, uh, Gizmodo, the, the dying internet website of nerd culture and all that kind of stuff has been laying off a ton of people and it's starting to show in their work. Most recently, they have released an article titled uh, New Dungeon Master's Guide Promises to Make D&D &D Accessible to Friends and Foes Alike. Uh, they got a preview copy of the Dungeon Master's Guide, and Gordon Jackson, supposedly, uh, made a uh, review and interview with io9 about the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, it was updated today as of the recording of this, October 22nd. Uh, it unlike any reputable news organization, they did not list what the update was. It simply just says updated. So in the article itself, it's removed a lot of the false statements and poor wording and choices that were made in the article. But if we were to bring it back, uh, Robert Reeve on Twitter, uh, he's, he's one uh, member of the D&D community, and... He, he pointed out that uh, they've clearly been pivoting to AI uh, because a writer was using AI speech to text to write the article and an editor was using AI to edit the article and left many very large errors in, uh, including but not limited to some small things like the uh, Spider Queen, the, demon the demonic Spider Queen, Lolth, L-O-L-T-H, very popular character in D&D, &D, been around for a while, while being known as Lull, as in L-U-L-L, -L, because text to speech, and that was not caught in editing. Um, also small things like choosing to explain that a DM plays characters, all of the characters, instead of just simply using the common term of non-player character or NPC to describe those. But most interestingly, uh, bringing in, <laughs> uh, actress Eliza Fisher apparently worked on the Dungeon Master's Guide. That is false. She did not, uh, Alyssa Vischer, V-I-S-S-C-H-E-R, did work on the Dungeon Master's Guide. So some very clear, obvious mistakes that they just have chosen to quietly update 
today and I I the the great collapse of the internet we're, we're we're seeing a big collapse of these more traditional news sites in a lot of ways Gizmodo is struggling things like Kotaku really struggling and it's all of these companies have been laying people off left and right and I just wanted to talk about this mostly as as a way to point out that this is happening that you should keep an eye out for these poorly written articles that are clearly using AI to just kind of crap out just terrible content that they can get out quickly and just churn and churn and churn. And I can't wait for sites like Kotaku for Gizmodo for all of these kinds of things to just go away. Well, here at the Dungeon Bros, we promise we'll never use AI to write articles. We probably also won't be writing articles, but that is beside the point. All right, chatgpt.com. Let's see. Nope, nope, okay. Open AI. Start now. Write an article about Magic the Gathering written by the Dungeon Bros. Unleashing the Multiverse, a Dungeon Bros guide to Magic the Gathering. Greeting planes, <laughs> planeswalkers, and adventurers, the Dungeon Bros are here to delve into the enchanting world of Magic the Gathering, where strategy me Anyway. <laughs> Alrighty then. <laughs> How to play. The We're way that talk started, it... <laughs> We're going to talk the way about that deck started, construction. It felt like uh <laughs> It felt like a classic like late 2012 style hype video for some random product out there when people oh, just started promoting energy drinks. <laughs> and all the all like the Twitch streamers that have like their fucking gamer juice and shit. Yeah, it's Oh, I need I need all this caffeine and this hydration to sit at my desk and game. It's like drink water, dude. Um, all right, let's see. What is there anything drink fucking water, go horrifying bed. here? Everything seems kind of fine. Like nothing's crazy. It's just all bland and soulless. And ooh, MTG's various formats catering to different play styles and preferences. The first they list: standard, a rotating format that includes the most recent sets, ensuring a dynamic and ever-evolving metagame. Commander, a popular casual format where players build 100 card decks around a legendary creature or planeswalker. It's not all planeswalkers. Fuck that up. Also, apparently we would say we would say greetings planeswalkers and adventurers. <laughs> I don't know what makes this dungeon bros, but oh, oh no. Yeah, <laughs> oh, this the, is good. I'm, I'm excited. The ending. What is this? The ending, the last thing, until next time, may your draws be ever in your favor. I wonder where it got that from. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Gizmodo. are such big Hunger Game fans. <laughs> right? Apparently they're writing another one that's like a prequel thing, and it's another movie that's... Oh, kind of, I saw I that. I could not care less, honestly. Uh, all right, moving on, <laughs> moving on. Gizmodo, I hope you die. Um, the website, not the people. The people, I'm sure, are fine. Foundations, foundations. Uh, we've the pre-sale and pre-orders have already gone out for Magic: The Gathering Foundations, which is going to be coming out in less than a month. And we got a little early preview, courtesy of Star City Games, for uh, preview cards. So they have revealed three Planeswalkers that will be in the set. These are all mythic Planeswalkers. These are all reprints as well. We are getting the ever-terrifying Liliana Dreadhorde General, the four black black six loyalty Liliana Planeswalker that has the stack ability. When, creatures you when a creature you control dies, you draw a card. Plus one to make a 2-2 two -two black zombie. Minus four where each player sacrifices two creatures of their choice. You would get to draw two cards off of that. And then the minus nine where each opponent chooses a permanent they control of each permanent type and sacrifices the rest. We also get a Johnny Caller of the Pride, a one white, white, four loyalty, Planeswalker Johnny. Plus one to put a counter, uh, plus one, plus one counter, and up to one target creature. Minus three to where to uh, give a target creature flying and double strike until end of turn. And then minus eight to create X2-2 two, two, white cat creature tokens where X is your life total. 
that can't be busted at all. And last, we have Vivian <laughs> Reed. Three green green for a five loyalty legendary planeswalker Vivian. Plus one. Look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature or land card from among them. Put it in your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Minus three to destroy target artifact, enchantment, or creature with flying. The classic green removal. And minus eight to get an emblem with creatures you control. Get plus two, plus two, and have vigilance, trample, and indestructible. Uh, these also come with beautiful brand new arts uh in a frame break full art style that have referenced uh other arts that these characters have been depicted in sam we've got we've got planeswalkers coming back to standard and uh though though the commander implication of these cards is probably not very high uh in standard planeswalkers can very quickly take control of of games oh yeah uh, they absolutely can. Uh, and just looking at these cards, because, again, they're all reprints. Uh, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, was just reprinted at the beginning of 2024 uh, in mm. Ravnica Remastered and is still about $17. Uh, Vivian Reed was recently reprinted in uh, Modern Horizons 3 Commander, I believe, mm-hmm. and is a couple of cents. And a Johnny Crawler of the Pride, I don't believe, has been reprinted here recently, but is still a couple bucks. Um, of course, you know, not necessarily a huge um, uh, value play here. You know, when, it, we did, when we talk about a lot of cards individually and a lot of value, we're looking at things like secret layers. However, here, Liliana is still kind of a, a not a bad little chase card in this set. Um, we've, seen, we've seen a couple other cards from the main set and the starter box. And... As as non standard players, I don't know. This seems pretty cool. I I agree. I mean, planeswalkers are always going to be very fun. Right now, I'm looking at um, I'm looking for the Costco recently. We talked about Costco recently having the um, a bundle for. Oh, apparently, you can get a bundle of all four of the of the fallout commander decks for 124 dollars as well as a couple of packs maybe at costco that's interesting that's not that's neither here nor there i'm looking for let's see what's the promo cards what are the promo cards because i think okay no it was a different ajani one of them was an ajani and i wasn't sure if it was the same ajani that they're reprinting here uh but yeah i mean these these planeswalkers are fine. Uh, obviously, I think Liliana has that highest price just because it had it's of the three the planeswalker that has a static ability, and it's a static ability that gives you card draw for doing the thing that a deck that would want this card is already going to be doing a lot of and getting value off of. So you know, a, a black uh, aristocrat's strategy in standard is probably going to have a lot of support with something like Liliana. Six mana is a lot. Um, but I mean, uh, these kind of one-on-one games can tend to go a little bit longer just cause it's harder to chip in damage, uh, as opposed to a four player format. So we, we are in the thick of preview season now for MTG foundations. I feel like we just got Duskmorn, uh, but that's just kind of how these sets go these days. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on now to the meat and potatoes here of this podcast uh sam i added a link for mtg insider because i forgot about the spider-man magic the gathering set that they announced so spider-man i want pictures of (laughs) (laughs) spider-man absolutely more pictures of spider-man so in a recent uh a recent press event for magic the gathering they revealed uh some of the marvel things that are coming forward for Magic the Gathering. We got a preview of the a new secret lair that is going to be coming out very, very soon uh, that depicts several Marvel heroes. This was at New York Comic Con. Uh, but they also gave us inter- uh, information about a Spider-Man Magic the Gathering crossover where they specify that it is going to be a full Magic set Um well, hold on, hold on. Update. According to an exclusive Polygon interview, is a full-size set, not a small thing. We previously did, when they announced it, we did not know if it was going to be like a commander deck or a secret lair thing. 
Uh, no concrete details, so we don't. So uh, assuming it's a set, we're probably going to be able to draft Spider-Man. Uh, I think it's interesting that they're choosing to spin off Spider-Man as his own set, and it will also be released in 2025. So we now get to add another set. I'm going to put that into the rundown right now, just because Universes Beyond Marvel is going to be separate from Spider-Man, which I find somewhat interesting. I I imagine that has to do with the licensing from Sony versus Marvel, maybe? Well, when when we first when they first announced uh the Marvel collaboration, the Marvel crossover, they did say that uh this was going to be a multiple flagpole style mm-hmm. Uh, uh, crossover, meaning we will see multiple sets, and as far as Spider-Man goes, I mean, Spider-Man is is very well loved. I, I look how many movies there are. Oh, no. I know, right? They keep rebooting it constantly. Um, now, what I want to know is, if is the largely unknown 2025 Marvel set just the Spider-Man set? And then 2026, we're going to get the Avengers set or an X-Men set or whatever. Um, obviously I feel like there's going to be some of those characters in a Spider-Man set. Like they're like mm-hmm. Dr. Strange has crossed over with Spider-Man many times. Like Spider-Man's like there, there's plenty of characters that have crossed the boundaries between them. Uh, there's been plenty of mutants that have shown up and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm I want to, I want to, I'm curious to see if this Spider-Man set is just the 2025 Marvel set and we're not getting to. I feel like that's what makes logical sense to me because you wouldn't want to have these two massive uh, universes beyond sets like releasing on top of each other. But at the same time, I don't think you want to be like spreading these out over a ton of like a ton of years, especially if we get in like one or two sets in and it's like, oh, these Marvel sets kind of aren't doing as well as we thought they would. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, they plan obviously three to five years in advance, um, and and you got to imagine they are banking on the fact that Marvel is so popular, and that it's going to do well. Um, yeah, we'll have to see. Of course, uh, with the fact that the uh, first Universes Beyond set of the year usually releases in uh, late Q two, early Q three. You got to imagine that they're going to be uh, busting out of their seams to try and tell us about it here very soon. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Once we get into, I feel like once we get through foundations, we're going to start getting more details about the Innistrad remastered set. And then once we're through that, it's going to be like, here's the slate for the year. Like we should be getting that slate Mm -hmm. uh, probably post post uh, foundations on November 15th and before Christmas would be my guess. Of course, we but do the, also have a Magicon coming up. They might announce something. Also very true. That would not be very timeful for this podcast as we are recording it before <laughs> Magicon Las Vegas, and it goes out to the free feeds the day after Magicon Las Vegas. So this might be outdated the moment that it's released to the public. So You watching it right now would know. We recording it don't know. You watching it right now probably probably knows and you're like these fucking idiots uh i don't know we might we might do like we might do like a little bonus podcast who knows it depends on how big the information is really but let's move on to secret lair marvel uh we have five new secret lair drops themed around five fan favorite marvel characters from various uh pillars of marvel comics so Free shipping on all single orders of these secret layers that are over $99. And if you spend $199 on the Marvel Super Drop, you will be getting a an additional bonus card, Earth's Mightiest Emblem, which is an arcane signet depicting the Avengers Tower, which is very cute. Uh, all of these are priced at the same price as your normal secret layer drops. Uh, We will first talk about the Black Panther one. We have Black Panther Wakandan King. This is a Selesnya one. The the 
legendary creatures, the heroes that we have seen, are all the exact same heroes that we saw leaked. Uh, I don't believe it was the last episode of the podcast. Was it the last episode of the podcast? It might have been the one before that. On a previous episode of the podcast, we talked about these mm-hmm. yeah. these leaks where we got to see uh, Black Panther, Captain America, Iron Man, Storm, and uh, Wolverine shown, but we did not get to see the other cards associated with them. So Black Panther, Wakandan King, we previously talked about. He likes plus one, plus one counters. He's moving plus one, plus one counters around. He wants to have a lot of creatures. So we get a uh, Secure the Wastes, which is an X white instance where you create X one one white warrior creature tokens. Uh, you get a sixth card, which is the warrior creature token as depicting uh, depicting a Wakandan warrior. We get Bost's Blessing, which is a primal vigor, four and a green. It's an enchantment, uh, basically doubling the tokens and uh, doubling plus one, plus one counters on creatures. Uh, we get a heroic intervention, one and a green, the classic protection spell, permanence getting hexproof and indestructible until end of turn, as well as the Wakandan Skyscraper, which is a Karn's Bastion. Uh, you can tap for a colorless, or you can pay for to tap and proliferate. Uh, the most valuable card that is printed here is the Heroic Intervention, which you can get cheaply, uh, the cheapest version for six fifty, followed by the Bots Blessing or Primal Vigor for four sixty eight. Karn's Bastion's only a dollar sixty nine, and Secure the Wastes is less than a dollar. Um, obviously, we do not know the prices yet of the legendary creature versions of them, as they are in pre sale and there are no listings up quite yet but i imagine they will be very expensive because they are all um new designs so this is one of the two secret layers that have six cards in them uh i think uh, i think by far the the reprint value from the black panther one is the the lowest Mm -hmm. yeah for sure yeah uh, next, we have Captain America, the first Avenger. Uh, as we talked about when we when we were discussing the leaks, I love that it is red, white, and blue for the mana cost and not white, blue, red, as it would normally be. Uh, but with Captain America, you are getting Captain America's aid, which is Sigarda's aid, a one mana enchantment that lets you cast auras and ench- equipment spells as though they had flash. And uh, you can attach equipment for free when they enter the battlefield. You also get a flawless maneuver to in a white instant. Uh, if you control your commander, you can cast it without paying its mana cost and creatures you get you control have indestructible. In the trenches, one white, white enchantment. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one. You can pay five in white to exile a non-land permanent you don't control until the enchantment leaves the battlefield. You can activate it as a sorcery, and you can only do it one time, sadly. Uh, and then the biggest reprint here, the Shield of War and Peace, which is a Sword of War and Peace, the three-mana equipment. Uh, equipped creature gets plus two, plus two, has protection from red and white, and uh, whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, this equipment deals damage to that player, equal to the number of cards in their hand, and you gain a life for each card in your hand. Obviously, the sword is the highest reprint, or sorry, no, Flawless Maneuver, is the highest reprint value, six fifty, followed by Sigarda's eight at four dollars, and then the sort of War and Peace, aka Shield, being three seventy five. Within the trenches, being a quarter. Uh, also, not a ton of reprint value here. Uh, I think of all the legendary creatures, Captain America is going to be the one that plays the most interesting because you're like attaching and unattaching equipment. When uh, this was announced, when this was leaked, I was like, oh. This is exactly what I said. I pr- you can go back. You can find mm-hmm. uh, old podcasts of us being like, oh, what are we going to see? I fucking predicted this. Absolutely, Called you it. did. Called it. It's so thematic. It's, it's absolutely perfect. Uh, the other six-card secret lair we are getting is the Iron Man Titan of Invention. Uh, he is the one that cares about treasure tokens and then using them to get other artifacts and then creating more treasure tokens and all of that. Uh, you get a treasure token that shows Iron Man's mask in a box. Uh, you also get Galvanic Blast, a one mana instant that deals two damage to any target. If you have Metalcraft active, which is you control three or more artifacts, it deals four damage instead. So it is either a better or worse lightning bolt, depending on the number of artifacts you have. Uh, the big reprint value here is the commander pl- Commander's Plate, a one mana artifact equipment. Uh, it can equip to a commander for three or equip to anything else for five. Quick creature gets plus three, plus three, has protection from each color that's not in your commander's color identity. Uh, you also get a reprint of Soul Ring, because we needed more Soul Rings. 
uh, that shows the mm-hmm. arc reactor. And then the Inventor's Fair, uh, which is a legendary land. At the beginning of your upkeep, if you control three or more artifacts, you gain a life. It taps for a colorless. You can pay for it to tap and sacrifice it to search your library for an artifact card, put it in your hand, reveal it, and shuffle. You can only do it, you can only activate that if you control three or more artifacts. Uh, obviously, $27.99 is the commander's plate. Inventor's Fair is $4.68. Soul Ring's a little over a dollar. Galvanic Blast is about a dollar. Uh, everybody has a treasure token, so I'm not even factoring that into the price. Um, <laughs> oddly enough, not the most valuable one. I think it comes in at about third in terms of reprint value, uh, the next two being one and two. Um, but there's a little bit of shenanigans going on with that. I love Iron Man, but that play style just, I don't know if that really appeals to me quite yet. I don't know. Yeah, I get what you're saying. Now, There's a lot of words on that card. A lot of artifacts. I've seen recently a CEDH game where they use Duretti to like be churning through artifacts in their deck and using things like Voltaic Key to repeatedly untap like big mana producers. And I feel like this Iron Man could fill a role like that. Five mana is a lot for a commander, but you get access to blue, so you get better counter spells. Uh, he's flying in haste, so he's a little bit evasive. He's going to be creating treasure, which these kinds of decks want. Uh, and then it's going to be churning through artifacts and shoving them into the graveyard through sacrifice. So I feel like there's shenanigans to get stuff back there, too. Um, a fun one, but definitely not really the play style that I usually look for, which I am very saddened by. Uh, next, we have Storm, Force of Nature, uh, which is Teamer in its color identity. Uh, giving instant and sorcery spells Storm when she deals combat damage to a player, which is very appropriate. Some examples of instants and sorceries that you can give Storm are Lightning Bolt, very appropriately. One mana instant deals three damage to any target. Uh, The second most valuable reprint here is Storm's Will or Jessica's Will, a reprint of Jessica's Will. Two in a red for a sorcery. You choose one if you control your commander. As you cast the spell, you can choose both, where you add a red for each card in a target opponent's hand, and then you can exile the top three cards of your library, and you can play them this turn. If you give a Jessica's Will Storm, you're going to be producing oodles of noodles of mana and have just so many cards that you'll be able to play. The... (laughs) The card that in name is very appropriate for the character of Storm, but a reprint that I don't think anybody was expecting is Ice Storm. Two and a green for a sorcery, destroy target land. This card was very, very old and has very low volume. It was originally an uncommon way back in the 90s. So because of that, it's $33.59 in non-foil. Interestingly, if you can get your hands on a Magic 30th Anniversary Proxy, (laughs) that is the cheapest way to get this card at $7.73. and then you get the Aurora Borealis, which is a Manamorphos, uh, one and either red or green hybrid mana. Uh, it's an instant. You add two mana in any combination of colors, and you draw a card. It's basically a free draw card spell, and it fixes mana if you need to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, any one of those, any one of those instants or sorceries being given Storm can be very, very powerful. Um, Jessica's Will, I think, is the most powerful one to give Storm, simply because you'll be able to then further Storm off into other things that natively have Storm. Um, But all of them are very good, and Ice Storm targeted land removal, I think, is a good thing to be bringing back. I think they should just straight up reprint Ice Storm into a modern set uh, mm-hmm. with with such powerful legendary lands and like things like Gaia's Cradle running around, and even... It, Targeted land destruction, I think, is going to be a good thing going forward. So it's nice to see a reprint of that. Lastly, Wolverine, best there is. Gruel Commander, he deals double damage. Uh, Not just combat damage, it's all damage. And at the beginning of the end step, if he has dealt damage to another creature, you put a plus one, plus one counter on him. So you're going to want a lot of fight spells. And then you can pay one in a green to regenerate him, much like Wolverine can regenerate. You are also getting uh, Berserk, which is a single green instant for... Uh, you can cast this spell only before the combat damage step. So after you can do this in your main phase, one, you can do this in... 
the declare attackers step or the declare blockers step. Um, Target creature gains trample and gets plus X plus O until end of turn where X is its power. At the beginning of the next end step, you destroy that creature if it attacked this turn. Uh, then you have Rite of Passage, which is two and a green for an enchantment. Whenever a creature you control is dealt damage, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. Rhythm of the Wild, one red, green enchantment. Creature spells you control can't be countered. Non-creature, non-token creature, creatures you control have riots, so you, they can either enter with a plus one, plus one counter or haste until end of turn. Uh, and then the Adamantium Bonding Tank, which is a reprint of the Ozolith, a one-mana legendary artifact. Whenever a creature control leaves the battlefield, if it had counters on it, put those counters onto the Adamantium Bonding Tank. At the beginning of combat on your turn, if Adamantium Bonding Tank has counters on it, you may move all the counters from it to a target creature plus one plus one counters uh you're gonna want wolverine to be slamming itself fighting as many things as humanly possible um berserk interestingly 1699 also largely because it's a very old card that hasn't been reprinted and then obviously the ozolith 1655 with rite of passage being 268.9 and the Rhythm of the Wild being 228. Uh, all of these cards are the ones that have the most value individually, though I believe the Storm one totals out the most just because of Ice Storm and uh, Jessica's Will combined total. What do you think of these secret layers? All of the non-foils are the regular price of $39.99. All the foils are the regular price of $49.99. Some people were saying that they would expect these to be a little bit more expensive, but they are not, thankfully. Uh, for what they are, I think they're cool but I'm probably not going to be getting any of them. Yeah, you can see where a lot, where some of them, mainly um, uh, uh, Black Panther, Captain America, and Iron Man, tended a little bit more towards the flavorful side of things. Um, and, and you can see that just kind of based on their low reprint value. Um, of course, the... Uh, Storm and the Wolverine being very high reprint value. Though with all of these, uh, Watsy really wants the goal to be you buy all of them and you get that uh, that arcane signet. Yeah, they they definitely want you to buy every single one of them. So five for a total of fifty dollars would be two hundred and fifty dollars plus shipping. Though sorry, no, you would get free shipping because you spent more than ninety nine dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's helpful. But I don't know. I think obviously we can objectively say that their value is going to be worth it simply because these are unique design legendary creatures that are popular characters. And those tend to be like, if you look at things like the 13th doctor from the doctor who's secret lair, like Rick steadfast leader from the walking dead secret lair, even though that one got an in universe version, Chun Li, even though she got an in universe version, those cards are still, holding very high value mm -hmm. and with the power that you're getting out of cards like storm uh like i would argue iron man i think has the potential to like like those two see seem like they have the potential for like cdh play uh just because they enable very specific strategies that are going to let people just win very quickly in some instances um i think they're very cool mm -hmm. you're probably not going to see me buying any of them if I were to, I would probably, yeah. I would want to get the Iron Man one because I'm biased, but the Storm one is just so valuable. <laughs> and so the Storm one seems more like your kind of your kind of jam. Oh, it's it's absolutely my kind of play style of the spell slingery storming off stuff. And Teamer is a color identity that I don't have a deck for yet either. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. How would you guys feel if I cast it? The storm count like seventeen, and I cast ice storm. <laughs> That'd be rude. That would be very rude. But I'd probably win the that. game. I'd probably win the game pretty quickly after that. Uh, that is all we have for the news. We do have one question from the Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. If you join there, you are given access to the Patreon feed where we put a podcast questions thread up for every single episode. Brandon wants us to know what are our thoughts on the upcoming Marvel set and if there are any superheroes that we are excited about seeing. I was a Spider-Man kid growing up. Obviously, I love Iron Man. We're probably going to get other versions of Iron Man eventually, uh, as opposed to the secret lair. Um, 
I want to see if they're going to be so bold as to get like some of the weirder ones, you know, like, like Deadpool mm. super, super popular, but it kind of is a little bit edgier than magic normally goes with some of their stuff. Um, and yeah. then you get weird things like the freaking horse Thor and all that kind of stuff. Like I want to see, I want to see them get into like the weird <laughs> frog Thor. There's frog Thor, but there's also, uh, the bill, the horse alien thing. Right? Oh, yes. Okay, that. Yeah, uh, Beta Ray Bill. No. Beta Ray Bill. Who, that's yes. the one. Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. not Beta Ray Bill. Yeah, okay. I I do, I do want to see a uh, Deadpool because mm-hmm. I've heard people talking like the card, the card will probably, you know, like if they, in the description, instead of saying, you know, when Deadpool enters the, ba- enters, it'll say when I enter. Yeah. Because he's breaking that fourth wall. I think that that'll be a fun thing they hopefully lean into um i i feel like you know if they do i feel i feel like they will pull a lot of those very like one-off or like strange characters or like really really old ones like 3d man yeah uh i feel like they could pull pull some of those and it would be really cool you know kind of like the way they did with the lord of the rings where or um Oh, what or like, uh, yeah, Doctor Who, where they brought mm-hmm. in these these characters that people hadn't heard about for thirty years, and everybody was like, "Oh, that's an awesome card now." Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Lord of the Rings, the fact that they were bringing up like Pelagrir, uh, like that was just a common creature, like Pelagrir survival, mm-hmm. uh, survivalist, and like random, like you, like obviously we were gonna get Tom Bombadil, but like we got a Goldberry. His wife. That's weird. We got Quick Beam, like a very specifically named Ent. We were like getting eagles called out. Like, yeah, I, I think I think we're gonna get some very interesting deep cuts uh, that I would be very excited about. Also, you bringing up Deadpool and you bring up the fourth wall breaks. I feel like I feel like someone could do a Deadpool secret lair. And include very weird un cards or playtest cards and then print them as like actual okay. cart. And you can get things like <laughs> booster tutor and like just weird things that just won't work in regular magic games. And then Deadpool, and because it's Deadpool, it's like, yeah, just grab that pack over there and play with that. You know, like, like just weird stuff like that, where he, he's just kind of breaking all logic of the game because like his, I mean, his character is like, he's breaking the logic of comics and movies and whatever he's in and putting him into magic, just yeah. have him break the rules of magic entirely. Uh, do things that they wouldn't design ever. I think that would be fun personally, but that'd be cool. That remains to be seen if Wizards of the Coast will be so cool. Uh, they might they might be too busy about uh, forcing people to not say bad things about them to to do cool things like that. So we'll right. see. We'll see. That is all we have for this, the Lord's 78th episode of the Duels of Mandarks podcast. A little bit of a short one, a little bit of a lighter one. Uh, the next one, we're having Magicon Las Vegas. Uh, we're also going to be on the eve of the Dungeon Master's Guide release, as well as the eve of the Foundation's release by the time we get to the next podcast. So there's going to be, I imagine, much, much more to be talking about for episode 79. It's going to be... It's going to be so fucking long. I can already, I can feel it in my, I can feel it in my fucking balls that it's going to be a long episode next time. So look forward to that. In the meantime, I'm going to try and get more rest. I'm very exhausted. (laughs) (laughs) Weddings and swim meets and working and working overtime and paying bills. And I got, I got my first, oh, I got my first tax bill for, for my house. That sucks. <laughs> oh. Thank God. Thank yeah. God my loan has, no, an I, es- I imagine. has an escrow account to pay for that because I saw that bill. I was like, yep. I hope, I, I, hope I, I don't have to pay that. <laughs> I'm giving you a lot of money. Do you pay it? And the guy was like, yes. Yes, Connor, we pay it. I'm like, okay, good. <laughs> Very it's, good. It's the whole Very thing. Good. Sam, Sam, I hope you I hope you rest after your extended multiple weekends of of extra working events in the great city of Cincinnati. Um, oh my God, hold on, wait, no, there was another thing. So SCG Con, 
SCG Con. We're not getting a Cincinnati SCG Con, sadly. There is going to be a Columbus SCG Con this time. Um, is it this? Wait, is it this year? Oh, shit. Oh, it's November 15th of this year. Okay. Well, anyway. Yeah, I'm not going to go to that. Anyway, <laughs> I thought it was next year. Okay. I digress. I digress. If it was next well, year, there will I'd be, be like, one next year, but th there will there's one in it said Atlanta in like I literally just pulled it up and closed it. I should have just I should have just left it up. SCG Con. You fool. That's me. That's me. Loading. Columbus, Atlanta, Portland, and Charlotte. I don't think I'm gonna go to any of those. Anyway. SCG Con Vegas or SCG Con Cincinnati. Can't wait for it to come back once they finally finish the fucking convention center. But anyway, anyway, I got excited because Brandon was asking us about, about us about that on on the Patreon recently. So and I was like, ah, probably not. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, that is all we have for this episode of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. Be nice to each other. Let people criticize you and the company that you may represent. And uh, as always, we love you very much. Peace.